If you feel guilty when you're spending money, that's a signal. It means that you, you don't know if what you just spent was good or mm. not. If you spend it and you're right, you don't know you're right. And if you spend it and you're wrong, you don't know you're wrong and you just did something horrible for your future self potentially. Welcome to the Military Money Manual Podcast, where every episode is all about achieving financial independence in the military faster than before. We believe personal finance shouldn't be boring or intimidating. Building wealth can be simple, and financial freedom is the ultimate financial goal. Now, here's your hosts, Spencer and Jamie. Hello, podcast listeners. I'm Jamie, and I'm here with Spencer Reese, the founder of MilitaryMoneyManual.com and author of the book, The Military Money Manual. We are very excited for today's episode. We have a very special guest joining us, Jesse Meekum from YNAB, or You Need a Budget, the YNAB system of budgeting and personal finance that we really enjoy. Hey, before we get into it, if you have a second to do so, please leave us a five-star review on Spotify or a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. That helps us out a lot and spreads the word about our show and the good things we're talking about here on the podcast. We now have over 100 five-star reviews on Spotify. Apple Podcasts is lagging a little bit behind with 41 reviews total, 4.9 overall. That's not too shabby. So you Apple fans out there, help us out a little bit and help bump up our numbers on the Apple side, please. So a little bit about Jesse. He's a personal finance expert and business leader. He's the founder of You Need a Budget, or YNAB, pronounced YNAB. Jesse hosts the You Need a Budget podcast, the Beginning Balance podcast, and is the Wall Street Journal bestselling author of You Need a Budget. For the You Need a Budget podcast, Spencer and I really enjoyed the episode called Ask Jesse, What Should You Do with a Life-Changing Windfall? That's number 588, published on August 22nd, 2022. So check out that out of his many episodes. We really enjoyed that one. Jesse is a self-proclaimed recovering CPA. He is deeply passionate about teaching individuals, families, and business owners YNAB's four rules to help them gain total control of their money. Jesse first developed the YNAB method and original spreadsheet as a broke, newly married college student who really needed a budget. In an attempt to make an additional $300 a month to help cover rent, he sold his spreadsheet online and YNAB was born. I love that story. Since 2004, the software has grown into a leading personal finance platform and has helped hundreds of thousands of people break the paycheck-to-paycheck cycle get out of debt, and save money. Today, YNAB has a growing team living and working all around the world and has built a thriving remote culture that has earned recognition as Fortune's number one best company to work for. That's pretty impressive. When not teaching people how to budget, Jesse loves gardening, woodworking, marksmanship, and travel. He also spends a good bit of time with his wife and the seven small people that live in their house. Woo! To learn more about Jesse and his team, visit youneedabudget.com. Quick personal note, I've been using the YNAB software for over three years now, and I'm a huge fan. I'm very excited to have Jesse Meekum on the podcast today. Without further ado, here's our conversation with Jesse Meekum from YNAB. Hey, Jesse, thanks for joining us on the show today. We're really excited to have you on the show, talk with our military officers, enlisted families, and military spouses. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Can you share a little bit about yourself, first of all, and how you got started in the personal finance world? Yeah, I wish it could be a glamorous start or something super romantic, but I was studying accounting and had three years left, married early. And so my wife and I were just kind of newlyweds. She wanted to be able to step out of the workforce once our first baby came along. And I wanted to make some extra money to cover that that shortfall. So we had been using a little spreadsheet that I had built using my newfound accounting skills. And it had worked pretty well for us as far as kind of getting on the same page with our money. And I thought maybe I could sell this little spreadsheet. And this was back before phones were anything but phones. You know, this was back when that was good technology. I launched YNAB in 2004 while I was still in school and finished up with a master's degree in accountancy and worked in that field for less than a year, realizing that I do like tracking where the money goes, but not not for big corporations. I like it for the people, you know, so... I didn't last long there, but, but here we are almost 20 years later. That's great. Jamie and I were actually stationed with your brother for one of our assignments in the Air Force. And you've got another brother in the Air Force as well. That's a pretty yeah. cool military connection there. Another small connection is both my brother and my sister are certified public accountants or CPAs. Oh, man. So, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, that must be so yeah, so I, I identify you with your comment about being a recovering CPA. I think my brother is a recovering CPA, my sister is going to be there soon. Initially, when you created the spreadsheet version, what what was the idea to to start selling it? It it was just to make the extra money to to support the family? 
how did you set up the website and stuff to get that going? Yeah, well, first of all, I have to kind of come clean on this. Like I'm the only the only son in the family that can't fly a jet, just to be clear, like where my skills lie. And so people are like, oh, what do you do? I'm like, well, I'm not a pilot like those guys. I just sit in front of a computer. And then my brother the other day was like, well, to be honest, I kind of sit in front of a computer while I'm flying as well. So it's <laughs> maybe more the same thing. But but no, I it really was like, I, I wish it was like this entrepreneurial thing where I'm like, oh, I had this itch I had to scratch. I had built a spreadsheet for me and Julie before we even got married before we had merged our finances, I was just like, man, we're going to be really, really poor. Like we're, we're not going to have a lot of money. We were making 10 bucks an hour as students and we lived on the cheap, but I knew we'd have to watch what we were doing with the money pretty carefully. And so I just built a spreadsheet for us that we use just personally, no, no concept of like, how oh, this will be a business. But then when our first baby was coming, I was doing some calculations. we had started to accumulate some savings It was really important to us that Julie be able to step out of the workforce and just focus on being the mom. So with her income disappearing, I was doing some calculations and I figured we would need about 350 bucks a month in other income I needed to scrounge up in order to get the last two years finished out and get my master's degree wrapped up. And then it was like off to the big accounting firm, become a partner, you know, that was the end of that. But it really was, we had a shortfall. I thought I could make it up. And so I just learned how to build websites by Googling. Google was kind of new back then, figuring that out as, as I went along. And if anyone wants to feel good about whatever they're doing, like feel really good about it, just go back, you know, use the archive.org site and look at YNAB from 2004 through until I found real design talent, you know, and like, <laughs> you'll know when the design talent was hired and when I stepped yeah. back from that. So, <laughs> but yeah, you just, you know, I just made it up as I went along. And, and the cool thing about that is you fail fast and, and you learn and, and you get better over time. So I wouldn't change anything except, you know, hopefully I could make those mistakes even quicker and, but at the end of the day, whatever mistakes you made brought you to where you are now. And I don't know if I'd change much. It kind of reminds me of the $100 startup idea because I'm, I'm going to make yeah. an assumption here that initially you probably just bootstrapped it, right? With your own, your own cash. Yeah, initially and forever. Yeah, it was 63 bucks. That was what Julie and I decided we could afford, which you're like, oh, that wasn't a lot of money, but that was half of our grocery money. Not that we spent grocery money, but just the equivalent framing. You know, it was like, well, half of what we spent on groceries for a month we're going to fund this. And it was, you know, it was almost zero. Back then you could buy clicks for five cents, you know, to try and test things out, which is how I could get kind of some early traction and see like, is this landing? Is it not? Things like that. That's awesome. Okay. Really important question now, Jesse, can you still do 31 pull-ups? I cannot. I'm probably in the 25 range. Like I, I can still crank them out. I've been hanging stuff off of my waist lately to try and change it up. I would rather do three really, really hard pull-ups than hang for 25. You know what I mean? So that's where I'm at. Yeah, I'm, I'll get a big kettlebell. I'll chain it up, waddle into position, and then bang out a couple triples. It works. So Nice. I like that. I mean, I think I would impress a Marine, you know, if someone were to be like, hey, do some pull I'd be like, all right, Marine, I can, I, can do, I can do a few of those. I won't run, though. When they ask me to run, I'll say no. Well, luckily you're talking to two Air Force officers, so I don't know how many pull-ups you're banging out, Jamie. I don't, am, I, am I stepping on toes? I hope I'm not. May, I, I might be, but... No, no, I, I can probably... I love it all. I have no favorites, so... In your bio, you talked about marksmanship. Is that riflery or bow? Handgun. Handgun, yeah. okay. I mean, rifle, like anyone can be a good marksman with a rifle. You know, it's when you have that, I'm just kidding. Like some snipers like, oh, you little, I can't <laughs> believe you said that. I would love to learn long gun stuff, honestly, because it's just all the math and everything. But yeah, specifically how fast you can get from, from holster to two shots downrange. That was kind of nice. my, that was what I liked. So, Were there any lessons that you've taken from your practice of marksmanship to apply to personal finance or are the two disciplines just so separated that you don't see any connections? I, you're throwing me softball, Spencer. I can tie anything back to money management, anything <laughs> at all. So there was a, when I first went and got instruction, and I have to frame it for everyone. I didn't grow up with guns. And so I was sitting in, in, a, in our congregation. It was a, all the men were together and we were planning an activity and they were like, Hey, let's do a shotgun activity. Who has a shotgun? And I was in Lehigh, Utah, which up until like 15 years ago had a hitching post at the high school, you know, like that kind of a place. 
And so everyone raises their hand except me that owns a shotgun and I didn't own anything. And I felt like a fish out of water. And so I went home and told Julie, my wife, I said, I, I need a gun if I'm going to fit in in this new neighborhood we moved into. And so for Christmas, she buys me this handgun and I opened it up and was genuinely mortified by it, like totally scared, fully inept. Like I had no idea how to use it. I was scared by it. I just, I like closed it up and stuck it up in the closet. And so I knew it was something I wanted to get comfortable with, but I was, I was as newbie as you could get. So I went and got some really good instruction and a couple of things stuck out. The one line that this one instructor gave me as he was trying to get us faster and faster is he broke the presentation down into five steps, which you think like you watch someone who presents fast from concealment or not, it doesn't matter, but there are five steps to that presentation. And I would have thought it was one step like, oh, you just grab the gun and there you are. And it's like, nope, it's, it's five and they're very discreet. And you can become very fast as you break them down and focus on just one of the five at a time. So that kind of blew my mind. And then as you're piecing together these five steps, he kept saying over and over, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. He would just chant that slow is smooth, smooth is fast. And that stuck with me because as you would just kind of slowly work it, you would get there. But if you tried to be fast, it just would fall apart. I always relate that back not just in money management, but when someone's trying to fix their finances, we oftentimes, one is we don't appreciate being methodological about it. We just try and be kind of haphazard. We pull a bunch of blog posts, we gather a bunch of things, we start to get excited about this or that little thing. And so I really try and get people to get down to like the fundamentals and that's those five steps. And then the next one is like, be patient, work it slowly. And you'll find that you get into this groove where you don't have to think about step two it happens, but you got to work them piece by piece. So that's, that's one tie in, but I have like a thousand more, you know? Well, I'll stop you there because that's a great segue <laughs> to my next question. That's not about guns directly, but it's about the four rules in the one app system. And yeah. you have a book, your book came out in 2017, right? That kind of yeah. gets into all the details of this, but can we go into kind of an overview of the four rules and however you want to break them down? And then I'll probably have a couple follow-up questions after that as well. Yeah, and I might just keep bringing it back to marksmanship for the rest of the time, but we'll, you know, we'll see. But I mean, the idea is your spending has to be on target. You want to be able to make a good decision about your spending. That's all it is. We don't teach people how to invest. We don't teach people how to retire early. What we're trying to do is get to the very first thing that matters. How are you managing your ins and outs? There's a framework that I stumbled upon, invented, or that we've just worked with long enough. We know really well, and it's these four rules. The four rules are there to help you make better spending decisions, full stop. And that can mean you're spending more. It can mean you spend less. I don't even care, but they're better and better for mm. you. you. You might say, I would never spend money, Jesse, on a jointer planner combo machine, which I just did. And I'm super excited about it. You're like, I would never do that. I would, in a million years, I would never do that. But I could point to something you have and be like, I would never spend money on that. It doesn't matter. It's just, was it a good spending decision for you? So with these four rules, if you think about them as a decision-making framework, it really helps. Our first rule is to give every dollar a job. The idea there is that you're wanting to experience trade-offs. If you do A, you can't do B. If you do B, you can't do C. Too often, especially in, in the U.S. where it's very consumer-driven, we don't feel trade-offs. We can just swipe a credit card and be like, oh, I solved that problem. I don't have to deal with running out of money. But we want you to feel like you are running out of money. And so the first thing we do is have you give every dollar a job. That, that starts to introduce trade-offs and that improves decisions. The second thing we do is we orient you forward. And so we want you to embrace your true expenses, meaning you're thinking ahead and you're looking to larger, less frequent expenses. You're breaking them up into monthly amounts and then you're introducing those back into the trade-offs. So now instead of just being like, do I want to do this today or that today? It's like, do I want to do this today or that tomorrow? Do I want to do this today or that in three months? And your decision-making has improved as you've kind of oriented forward. The third rule, and you guys would appreciate this as pilots or in any kind of military, any situation where it's at all dynamic, which is mostly life, we had to make a rule where you could change your mind, where you have a great plan, you've worked hard on the plan, you appreciate the 150 slides that you added to your slide deck for this plan, and then as soon as it actually starts rolling, you change things. And so when we're talking about a spending plan, 
it's the same thing. You have a great plan. You've done your best, but you don't have a crystal ball. So as soon as new things come in, you adapt. And our fourth rule is what we call aging your money. And really it means we want that guy or gal that just earned that dollar today or two grand today. We want that two grand to sit for a while in the system, to age, to get a little older. Too often we earn the money and the money's like a day old. It's like a little baby and you're sending it out. You're like, do this, do that. It's like, it's not ready yet. We want there to be distance between when you earn money and when you spend money. And with that distance, you get more time to be able to evaluate a decision and make the best call. So in that instance, giving yourself time also improves your decision-making. So really it's experiencing trade-offs, being future-oriented, being flexible, call it rolling with the punches, and then finally giving yourself some time to really make the best decision. And you can take that framework, you can be like, man, that kind of sounds like it'd be a good framework for time management or for you know, managing some dynamics. And you are right, because it, we're really trying to just allocate resources at the end of the day. And this works, works really well. Yeah, I really love all of them. Give every dollar a job is, is meaningful. All of these are principles that a lot of personal finance experts or books or podcasts talk about. Yeah. I like the way that you guys broke it down into four kind of easy to understand and easy to follow rules. The one I really want to call out is rule number three, which took me a little bit of getting used to when I became a YNAB user in 2019 over three years ago, because a lot of people in the military are very detail-oriented and it leads to sometimes budget not working because we said this was our plan and we're going to stick to it. Yeah. And that can be a challenge. And you mentioned a couple lines in your book that I'm going to, I'm going to just read real quick because I think it'll really hit this point. If you change your budget, you haven't failed at budgeting. You've adapted with the best of them. This flexibility isn't how most people imagine a budget, but it may be the key to making it work. And then you go on to say, it's not a failure, but a reprioritization. You're not accountable to every line item in your budget. It would be like holding yourself to the hour by hour schedule you wrote a week ago. It just won't match reality. So changing my budget is not failing. And I think when I read that line, my wife was like, oh, sick burn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because that's exactly what so many of us struggle with, being able to adapt to a plan because we spend so much time making the plan perfect. And that's not just about money, but especially with money. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, the, the plan is only as good as you can, as you can adapt to it. And uh, I don't know where we get that. No one does it in real life in any other form. I mean, when you guys fly, it, you try and stick to the plan. But, you know, I mean, there was one time my brother stuck me in a simulator and he was like, hey, just try and keep the plane steady. I think as he was getting his wings, I think it was part of this and we were on, on base for that. And he's like, just keep it level. I couldn't believe how hard it was <laughs> to keep that stupid thing just level, you know? But he's like, the simulators where they would throw everything possible at you, like it would never happen in real life kind of situations. There's a lot to learn in that. And the last thing you'd want to do is be like, well, hey, that wasn't part of my plan. Therefore, flying doesn't work. You know, we, we would never make that conclusion. So anytime you're planning your, your son's football practice or you're planning a vacation, you, you got to be adaptable. It's just, a, it's just driving on a road that you always drive on and you see there's a detour and you just go around. No big deal. Yeah, there was a couple thoughts that I had when you were running through those lists right there was, as an economics major, you know, giving every dollar a job and forcing people to choose, you know, do I want A or do I want B? That's just opportunity costs from yeah. economics. But it forces you to assess your values, right? And it forces mm -hmm. you to decide what do I actually want to do? Because money is a finite resource. Time, time is a finite resource. And most of life is made up of finite resources that you have to allocate Absolutely. in some way and if you don't have values that drive those decisions, well, then this is going to force you to either figure out those values, develop those values, or just to say, what are my values? And if you don't have values, yeah. I think the good life is made up of, of values, right? Whatever your definition of the good life is, you have to have some values behind it. And if you're just floundering, if you're just flapping in the wind and going whichever way, I think it would be a life not worth living. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's well put. The other thing you said was, you know, with rule three, they're rolling with the punches. And it reminded me of a couple of things, you know, no plan survives first contact with the enemy mm -hmm. or with reality. And you got to, you got to continuously update. You got to iterate. And if you don't, and you're just like, no, 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 this is the plan. We're sticking to it. It's unrealistic. And it's, it's going to drive you crazy. If you contact reality and you realize, okay, we spend a thousand dollars a month on groceries and that's what happened last month. And that's okay. If that doesn't align with our values, because we had to choose, you know, $200 that we missed spending on something else, then you have to, you're forced to make that choice. It almost reminded me of mindfulness or meditation where 
Mm-hmm. When you're trying to be mindful or you're trying to meditate and focus on the breath, when you lose that concentration and your monkey mind runs off and you start thinking about something else and you're like, oh no, I'm thinking about something else. Come back to the breath. And everyone's like, oh, I failed. I failed. I meditate. No, no, no. Yeah. That's, that's the bicep curl right there and paying attention. And so your rule three about rolling with the punches, that's budgeting. That's adapting mm-hmm. what you're trying to do and, and figuring out what your values are. And then adjusting your spending so that you match those values. So I think I think those four rules, I, I don't know how you stumbled on them, but I really like how they, they kind of encapsulate this framework. And like you said, it doesn't just apply to money. It can apply to time. It yeah, can absolutely. apply to, to so many other factors of life. I think I'm wired innately to care about resource allocation in the most general sense. And so when I was building the spreadsheet that had these rules in it, I didn't know I was building something that enforced these rules, but it naturally enforced what I thought should be taken into consideration. You know, I I hate when I see people work so hard for a dollar. And then as soon as all of their effort is converted into a dollar, they're suddenly just like, ah, whatever. I'm so surprised by that. You have these guys that have gone through just crazy training. They're experts in their field. And then they're just like, oh, I don't do money. And you're like, what are you, what are you talking about? You don't do money. Like, why are you so effortful and intentional and mindful and strategic about all of your career. And then as soon as all of that career effort is converted to a dollar, you're just like, ah, whatever happens, happens. It's such an incongruent thing that it bothers me to my core that I see that happen. Like energy is converted from time into a dollar and it's still energy. It's still valuable inherently. And so we want to make sure that we're deploying that energy. It's just, just stored up energy. We're just deploying that to where it lines up with our values. There's the contentment. It's not that you make more. It's not that you retire early. Those are all great things. But when your money is lined up with what you really value, it's a part of you that's lined up with what you really value. It's just you and all of your past efforts. And so when those two are, are on the same track, I mean, we have people constantly tell us like, I feel better. I'm not making more money. I'm not even really saving more money, but I just feel better. We're like that's because there's, there's some congruence now. Yeah. I love that. That's so good. Uh, I want to jump back to rule two for a second, talk about embrace two expenses. I have two questions on this one. The first one is about the impact of inflation because we're expecting a relatively high military pay increase if it gets approved, but it still doesn't keep up with inflation. So any tips or what do you recommend for military families that are struggling with the cost of living right now? I mean, it's one of those things where if you were to go piece by piece, you could say, you know, talk about rolling with the punches, you'd be looking ahead and you'd say, well, we normally spend, a, you know, a thousand bucks on groceries and we were ready for that. We've been, we've been used to that. And suddenly it's 1200 and it's like, well, where does this come from? And, you know, companies and employers, military as well, they try and keep up with that, but it's lagged. Everything is delayed. There's not this instantaneous thing. The best thing you can do is revisit these rules. Rule one, where you're saying, okay, we have trade-offs here to make. And I've actually entertained the idea of just telling people, hey, there's now an inflation category in your plan. Wow. And it's meaningful. Like you can't just pretend it's not there. You'd mentioned Spencer, you know, reality is knocking and inflation is one of those realities. So the worst advice I could tell you is, oh, I think inflation will do this or that. It doesn't matter what we think. What are you paying at the store? What's happening? And this is reality. So the worst thing you could do is just say, I'll just wait for it to change. You can't, you are dealing with a finite resource and you've got to make sure that you're, you're adapting. So you work the same system. You start to make trade-offs. You start to cut corners where you can. And there are corners that you will not cut. And those are also your values. And that's totally appropriate. But it goes back to each their own in that way. There's no quick fix to this. If there were, man, I'd be, I'd be on all the major news outlets letting everybody know how to handle it. But at the end of the day, that you cannot bury your head in the sand. You know, you can't say, all this will pass. It, it could be with us for a while. These things take a long time. And we're all, you know, roughly the same age. We have not experienced this. The millennial generation that's now the largest members of the workforce, we have not experienced something like this. We can ask our parents and they can tell us about 11% mortgages, but we've grown up in a space where it's like, wait, what? Savings accounts pay more than 0%? What is this? You know, <laughs> it's, it's all new. So we have to be adaptable. We have to keep working the plan. Yeah, eyes wide open, facing forward. I love that. All right, the second question I have for Embrace Your True Expenses is a little more practical tip. Let's say a military family, young military family, they just found out from the mechanic that they need four new tires on their minivan or their SUV. How does the YNAP system encourage them to set a goal for 
their tires are going to be good for, let's say, four or five more months. How do they embrace their true expenses okay. and, and build that into their budgeting month by month so it doesn't just slam them with a, with a credit card payment? Yeah, yeah. So but now a lot of times when you're first starting with the rules, you're, you're dealing with a lot of decisions that prior you has made. And so you got to kind of dig yourself mm-hmm. out of that to a degree. If the tires, you know, check the treads, first of all, like brass tacks, like anyone that sells tires is going to tell you, you probably should get new <laughs> tires. Anyone that sells houses is going to tell you, you should either move or buy, you know, whatever. Trust, but verify. So you do need new tires and you know that they're going to cost you a thousand bucks in five months. That means that you'll be setting aside $200 each month for the next five months. And you just build that up. And our software helps you do that, but you can do that with a spreadsheet. You can do it with some auto transfer from an account. You can do it all kinds of different ways. But the idea is you're paying for that bill before it happens. I'll say it this way, actually, Jamie, this is kind of an interesting way to think about it. You're sitting there at the tire shop and it's almost like what we're trying to create is a situation where your current priorities and your future priorities are on the, on an even playing field. And so you have like future Jamie and then current Jamie, and they're kind of negotiating, like, I want this money now. And future Jamie's like, well, I want some of the money for later because I'm going to be on the side of a road and a tire will have blown out and that's going to be really expensive. So throw me a bone here. And so what I try and have people imagine is you're at the tire place, you have the thousand dollars for the tire, right? And then in walks, I don't know, the pizza delivery guy. And he's like, hey, you have a thousand bucks for the tire, but could I interest you in $80 of pizza right now? You won't have enough for the tires now, but you'll have this pizza now. Nobody would be like, yeah, I'll take that deal. Like I want to, I want to not buy the tires. I'm going to buy the pizza. So everyone makes good decisions once they're presented with good information. Unfortunately, we rarely ask our future self, hey, do you need anything? Will you need Mm. something? It's always just like, hey, pizza guy, pizza sounds good. Let's do pizza. I love pizza. I'm all about buying pizza, but I also know that I wouldn't give the pizza guy any money if I needed to buy new tires. And so what we're trying to do is present that situation hypothetically for people all the time. And it's like, you're looking ahead and you're saying Christmas is coming up. I mean, Christmas is not far away now. So what are we going to do? You're buying tires. And then, you know, your daughter walks in and is like, daddy, I would like a Christmas present. No one actually is doing that. But like, am I going to buy sushi or am I going to buy a fair Christmas present? I don't actually do that mental math, but it's this idea of all things considered equally, because then the values, as Spencer mentioned, the values start to really be fleshed out. And that's, that's where the magic happens. Would you rather have a nice Christmas or go to the bar a few more times? And everyone's like, I, yeah, Christmas actually sounds right. Okay. But then sometimes, sometimes you actually do want to go hang out and have a good time and not have guilt plague you afterward. That's what we want to have happen. Yeah. And I think the YNAB system is is great for that. Avoiding that spending guilt where you, you know, that dollar has a job and that job right now is to increase your fun time with your friends. And that's, that's so important, right? The social, the social connection. Absolutely. If, if, you, if you feel guilty when you're spending money, that's a signal. It means that you, you don't know if what you just spent was good or mm. not. If you spend it and you're right, you don't know you're right. And if you spend it and you're wrong, you don't know you're wrong and you just did something horrible for your future self potentially. So either way, whether you can afford it or you can't afford it, the feeling is the same. It's uh, consternation, it's friction, it's guilt. It's just a little thing in the back of your head. It's like, I hope this is okay. Misplaced hope. But what we want to get is where you're swiping the card with joy. You know, you're at Disneyland and you are buying the churro that hopefully is still the same price. We'll see. They say that that's the best inflation indicator is the churro <laughs> pass. I don't know, but that's what I heard. So Jamie, you and me got the churros, didn't we? We did. They were like eight, $8 or something. They were pretty expensive. Yeah. So maybe if, if Disney and if Costco gave up on the $1.50 situation with the hot dog, then we know we're really in a bad spot. Yeah. They're still holding the line at a buck 50. But my whole point, Tangent City, but my whole point is that when you know you can afford something, it's so great. It's so great. It's the, that is the way you should operate is I can buy this happily. And then here's another signal. When your spouse is spending money on that quirky hobby that you still don't understand after 10 years of marriage, and you're happy to see them do that, now you know you've arrived. Right. (laughs) I love that. We had a podcast episode number 47 about breaking the paycheck to paycheck cycle. For me personally, I, I was stuck in one when I was a young lieutenant. I was in pilot training and 
I would put all of my expenses on the credit card. My paycheck would come in. I'd pay off the credit card. And I'd have about $15 to get to the next paycheck. And so I just put all the expenses back on the credit card. It was after I got married and I, I had a spreadsheet and I showed my wife the spreadsheet and, you know, the money would come into the checking account. She'd be like, oh, great. We have a thousand dollars. I'd be like, oh, no, no, no. I, there's a credit card we have to, we have to pay right. off. And she's like, okay, so how much money do we actually have? And I'm like, well, probably about, you know, 15 or $30. So just put the expenses on the credit card. And she said, no, I'm not living like that. We have to, yeah. we have to fix this. We're living paycheck to paycheck. And Ed, she had made her own money previously. She was a well-paid pharmaceutical rep. And she was much better at budgeting than I was. So once we broke that cycle and we, we basically froze our spending, you know, for 30 days until we, yeah. could, we could start getting ahead again and, and aging our money. But what are some other tips that you have for listeners on getting out of the terrible paycheck to paycheck cycle? I don't like to give people don't spend money on this, don't spend money on that kind of a thing. I want them to kind of discover it on their own and be able to become aware of where they're spending, become aware of their priorities, and then start to see where money is going toward things they don't really care about. I will give you a a shortcut, though, just to save people the trouble. I have interviewed thousands of people at this point. We have so many data points. A lot of people get out of tons of debt because they realize, oh, I don't really care to be in all this debt. I don't care to pay all this interest would I rather not spend my money on those things? And the answer is always yes. So you have people that have just dug out of tens of thousands of dollars of debt fairly quickly. And I'm always like, well, wait a minute. You were living paycheck to paycheck. You barely had nickels to rub together. You're in 30 grand in debt. And then nine months later, you're out or two years later, you're out. Like what, did you get a big raise? Which aunt died? You know, like what happened here to help you out? And and they're like, no, the aunt is still healthy, you know? (laughs) Every time, every time. And I try not to put words in people's mouths like, did you do this? Did you do that? Where did you find the money? Every time, without fail, without exception, they have said, we cut back eating out. Mm. So I hate to be like the bearer of boring, boring advice, but that is the first place people notice incongruent spending. They start to realize how much actually is going out the door for that. They start to realize that taking 20 minutes to make a quick meal is less time than driving 30 minutes to go and grab something quote unquote quick. There are all kinds of things they start to realize as that money matters to them more doing something else. And that's the point because I also interviewed someone one time who said, well, I spend about three grand eating out and I like fell out of my chair. That's not my jam. And they loved it. So I was like, okay, okay, I can get there. But it was interesting to hear them still go through the same exercise of, wow, look how much I spend. Do I really love to do this? And they straight up, I mean, I'm not, it's hard work to spend three grand eating out. You got to really choose your places carefully. You can't be doing Chick-fil-A, you know, like you, no. that's too much no. Chick-fil-A. Like you got to, you got to go to the spendy spots. I didn't ask him like, do you do wine? You must do wine. But whatever it was, he loved it. So It's just cool to see that people come to conclusions where they're like, I'm not going to spend money here and they don't feel like they've lost a thing. So that's one quick way to break the paycheck to paycheck cycle is just look there first. There are other things you can do, but as you work the first rule and you work the second rule, you'll start to see where money's going places and you're like, I'd rather have it do something else. No shame, no guilt, no like uber frugalness just to be frugal. None of that. Just priorities, money going out the door. Let's make sure they line up. So for a guy that has a company that has the word budget in the title, it's not a very popular word. I hate it. <laughs> I hate it. Yeah, worse. Is, is there any income level or net worth where you tell people they don't need a budget anymore? Or how does that work? Honestly, if we were to change our name to just YNAB and you never knew what it stood for, <laughs> I'd be like, yeah, that's what we are. Like, we're just YNAB. Forget, forget what I ever thought about you need in a budget because people think about it incorrectly. And we spend 45 minutes being like, no, 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 no. It's not that you can't spend. No, no, no. It's not that it's restrictive. No, no, no. It's not shackles from your spouse. Like we'd spend so much time unwinding all of the bad ideas that people have. It'd be like, if I said, Hey, Jamie, let's go on a diet. You're just like, "Mm, no, I don't think so. You know, like there's just so much baggage attached to it. So I really hate the word. What we teach people is not budgeting. I'll just say that right now. We teach people a whole new way of making spending decisions so that they love how they spend their money. That's what it is. We want you to love how you spend, love how your spouse spends. 
love spending money on your kids, love spending money on your hobbies, love spending your money to get out of debt, budget, whatever. I, I just, I really, we don't do that. We don't even teach it. We just teach people how not to do it. And it works really well. So back to your specific question, is there an income level where someone just doesn't need to worry about careful spending or strategic spending? No, absolutely not. If you make a million dollars a year, you have, I would say, this is as close as Jesse gets to morals. I would say you have a moral imperative to allocate those resources well, because you have a lot of them and you could do a lot of good. And I mean, good the way you define it, right? Not the way I would. It is a moral imperative to have all of that useful resource at your disposal and not do good with it by your definition. So that's why you still need a quote unquote budget. You need intention behind valuable resources. And if you were to say, no, at this point, I have so much, I don't need intention. I would say, man, God is playing a trick on me right now. You know, that's not, I don't like this because I want to see people that have so much resource, so much discretion to be able to exercise that discretion and say, oh, let's, let's do something meaningful with it. So there is no income level where it's appropriate to waste. And I'll let waste be defined by the person. Jesse, the anti-budget, is this some, a concept you're familiar with where you just set a high savings rate and then spend the rest of you, you've heard, okay, yeah. so you've heard of this. I think that's probably me, honestly. <laughs> I, I, yes, I know some, some high net worth, high income individuals, you know, usually dual income or dual mm -hmm. military spouses, and they just set a ridiculously high savings rate. Maybe they set, you know, we're going to give 10% of our income to the church or to charity. And then they just spend the rest as they see fit and yeah. they don't really track it. They don't really worry about it. But by doing that, they know that, oh, it, you know, within 10 or 15 years, we'll be financially independent. And our spending is essentially, they probably did the hard yards in the beginning where they tracked yeah, all of their spending early on. So do you see a fit with YNAB with kind of the anti-budget where, because maybe every dollar has a job, but the job is just general savings. Yeah. You've built in a situation where, you know, your main objective is being achieved. And so you can really relax. Like you certainly don't need to be super granular. You know, when Julie and I were first married, I could be like, Julie, how much did this can of corn cost? You'd be like 65 cents, you know? Right. But I got it down to 42 because I did X, Y, Z, you know? And now if you're like, Julie, how much did you just spend 10 minutes ago at Costco? Roughly plus or minus a hundred dollars. She'd be like, I don't, you know, <laughs> I don't know. So it d does, is she being wasteful? No, she's just buying food for the people that live with us, you know? So her granularity has changed. And this person that's doing the anti-budget kind of going for fire with lots of discretionary income, they're doing the same thing. It's like, I'm going to dial back my granularity to a couple buckets. And uh, I've tested that. I tested that a couple of years ago where I, I had giving, I had savings, and then it was like this massive other category. I ended the year with my checking account balance 15 grand less than what it normally is. Wow. And I don't know where the money went. So it kind of bugged me because I'm like, mm -hmm. where did that go? I, I, all yeah. of our goals have been hit and we have a high checking account. We, we store like we're saving up for a car in eight years. It goes in the checking account. Like we put everything in there. So it's a big amount. And I was just like, where did that go? It was during 2020. So maybe it was just like weird pandemic behavior. I don't know what happened, mm. but I personally didn't like not knowing on a more specific level, but there are other people that are totally okay because they know the big stuff's being done. And if it's working, like if you're checking the boxes and you're hitting your goals, do not listen to me. You're doing fine. <laughs> like don't change a thing, you know? Don't go check out the website. Don't adopt the software. Like why? Just, you got it going. It's good. But for people that are like, I need to learn a little more. I need to change a little more behavior. I don't have this amount of discretionary income they're going to need to be more careful. I mean, if you guys are flying low to the ground, are you, like, what's your level of attention, right? It changes. And so that's, that's what we're talking about here. But when you're cruising and you got it on autopilot and you're like, I'm going to go to the bathroom, literally, you know? So in that sense, we can adjust appropriately and it would be inappropriate to fly the entire time as if you were making an approach. You would annoy everyone you were talking to, <laughs> you know? Right. And, and <laughs> yes. so- it's appropriate to adjust our intensity. I guess I'll say that and, and let it sit. But money is still being allocated appropriately. And that's what we never want to lose. Yeah, I think if you are in that scenario where let's say you're mid six figures or high six figures income, 
And maybe you dial the granularity back a little bit where you can go to a restaurant and you can, it doesn't matter if the bill is $60 or $120, but at the end of the year, if you, you know, look back and you're like, man, we made, I don't know, let's say $200,000 and I can't account for $10,000, like $10,000 just vanished. You know, it it didn't Mm -hmm. go into something we wanted. Well, that's a $10,000 opportunity if maybe the next year you track and you figure out, okay, where did that money go? Or what are we spending money on that, that we don't know? And that's an extra $10,000 you may be able to give to the charity yeah. of your choice or that you might be able to throw into a kid's, what are they called? The 529. Yeah. Or just spend it intentionally. Like well, just yeah. be like, man, I, I could have bought something really awesome. You know, I mean, who knows? So, but yeah, if, if you don't know and it bothers you, that's, that's your signal. That's that little bit of friction we mentioned mm-hmm. earlier, whether it's guilt or an unknown or back of your mind how we could be doing better, or I wish this, then, you know, take a, take a closer look, but just go back and work the rules. You know, you don't have to work them with the granularity of what our software provides transaction by transaction, but you can still work the rules and be like, all right, what are our, what are our values? Is, is our money doing what we really want? And that's where the magic happens. And when you're in a relationship and you both can have that conversation instead of like, why did you spend this? Why did you spend that? And finger pointing, man, it's like suddenly you learn more about your significant other the relationship gets deeper and richer instead of all that friction. So there's just a lot to be gained by just working those rules. Levels of granularity depending on essentially how much discretionary income you enjoy, really. Right. Yeah. I love that. Love that. That freedom to, you know, be as much attention as you need on the subject. And then once you reach that point where you want to focus your attention somewhere else, then you can do that because you, you have the system set up and you, you know, it's running in the background and it's automated and your goals are being achieved and you don't have to stress about it so much. There are diminishing returns to you track and track and track and track. And it's like when people start saying, oh, I have a toothpaste category, so I'm ready for my next. You're just like, yeah, that's gone. you've gone too far. You know, you've taken it way too far. You can probably just swing the toothpaste when that thing runs out. And so that's the bit. That there are diminishing returns to the effort, and you want to make sure you're balancing that. So, Jesse, you must encounter the same questions over and over. Have you helped as the, have you hit a million users yet? Oh, I wish. App? No, we have, we have not hit a million. Well, you know, all in all, if I were to look back and see like who we've helped and along the way, we're, we're well above that. Yeah. It's not enough though. Is that your question? Am I satisfied? No, I'm not. We need more. <laughs> we, need, we need more people. Well, we hope, hopefully we can send some of our listeners to you need a budget.com or to the app, but what are some of the most common misconceptions or myths that you encounter about budgeting? You kind of addressed this a little bit earlier, but What's just like the top one or two things that people come in and they say, man, I don't want to do this. And you say, no, you need a budget. It's the name of the program. Yeah. I was being totally sincere when I said that I hate the name you need a budget. I don't mind YNAB because it's just like some weird word. You know, that's totally fine. But the first misconception is it's the idea that it's not flexible, which just kills it out of the gate. You will fail. You will fail quickly and you'll blame it on the process and you'll just say, "I, I can't do money or whatever. And that's a tragedy. The second one is that it means you can't spend money. Money is meant to be spent. That's the whole point. Like, I want to spend all of it. And if I outlive Julie, then I'll make sure it's all spent. (laughs) If she outlives me, she'll make sure it's all spent. It's an agreement we have, you know? It's meant to be spent. It's meant to be enjoyed. You've worked so hard for it. So enjoy it. And people come in and they think budgeting means austerity. It's just a plan. It really is just a plan. And it's your plan. You're the coach, you're the maestro, you're the boss, you're the captain, whatever. But it's all, it's all yours. And so you just work the plan. Actually, we see more people tell us that it is liberating. And I find that interesting considering their initial conception is it, it will be restricting. But they're like, it is so liberating to go out to eat with my girlfriends or whatever and not give it a second thought. And then what's cool is they tell all their girlfriends at the table that are sweating like, I shouldn't have gotten the extra nuts on the salad or whatever, you know, <laughs> they tell them like, no, actually I'm using this app and they flash it to everyone. We love when that happens. So I love that. But that idea of just like guilt-free value aligned spending, that's the whole point. You just, you're going to love, love how you spend your money. Have you read the book, Die With Zero? No, but I really like the title. Yeah. Okay. You need to read Die With Zero because it gets to exactly what you just talked about with the agreement you have with your wife, where if you outlive her, you're going to spend all the money. If she outlives you, she's going to spend all the money. And that's essentially what he argues in the book is don't wait. This is getting a little tangential here, but especially like if you have kids and you want to give them an inheritance, 
the time to transfer assets to them yeah. is probably between age 24 and 35. Because if you do it before that, they're too young and they don't know what to do with it. If you do it after that, if you've raised them right, they'll know what to do. But when people receive these million dollar inheritances when they're in their 60s or in their 70s, it's too late. Either yeah. they, their health has declined or they don't need the money because they went and made their own, you know, their own luck or they have made poor choices throughout life. And so they need the money and they're just going to waste it anyway. So yeah. I highly recommend you check out Die With Zero. It's a book we've talked about on the podcast before. I'll buy like five copies and just kind of leave it around the house for my kids to kind of just notice and be like, what is that? What is that dad's book? Oh no. Oh no. Oh, no. What's going to happen? Yeah. I was really banking on that. Yeah. Classic Warren Buffett situation. Okay, Jesse, this, this might be a little bit of a trap for advice because it might conflict a little bit with your values-based spending. But a question we've asked a couple other guests is, let's say that there's a young airman listening and they're stationed overseas in Japan. They have $3,000 a month, call it after taxes. And they have pretty low expenses, call it $1,500 a month. So pretty easy math, even for a history major. Mm -hmm. How would you help guide them to set up their budget with the remaining $1,500 that they have? Well, I would just walk them through the exercises we do with people. So one that you do is you don't think about the money at all. And you just start talking about what do you want? You live here in Japan. That would be a sweet place to live. If I lived there, I would try and learn Japanese. I tried one, one year for six months. I totally gave up. It was so <laughs> unbelievably hard. But if I lived there, maybe I'd have a better shot. So that's what I would do. I would seriously look at like acquiring some sweet sword while I was over there. I mean, like, <laughs> yes. is it just Jesse drops in Japan? And like, I would go get tutored by like a master Japanese woodworker and be like, how do you do this? So yeah, I would seize the day while I'm over there. You live in a spot that you won't live again, probably. And it's unique in the world and awesome in a thousand ways. So that's where my mind goes is like, we have an opportunity here. So yeah, we're throwing money in the TSP. You're fine. You've got a housing allowance that lets you live in this crazy expensive place for a very subsidized situation. So like all of this is working for you. That's where I'd go. Woodworking, samurai stuff, the language. Yeah. You live in this spot, like enjoy it, use it. Don't just sit in your apartment and jump on video games. I mean, that is a sweet, sweet opportunity. So yeah, I'd deploy the money that way. How's that for putting my will on someone else's money? That's what I would, it's totally what I would do. I love it. I'm excited just talking about it. Man, like I want to move to Japan. I just have to find a really, really big spot to stick all the kids, but. I don't think they make cars <laughs> big enough for your family in Japan. I know. I'd be, I'd be like, excuse us. Sorry, sorry. We got to, sorry, excuse us. I, I would just go down road to be like, honey, we we're at the end. We just have to leave this car here. We're stuck, you know, so. We were in Europe with a big Mercedes van one time and the tiny little roads, like in these tiny villages over in Germany and, and uh, Julie, man, she, I had lived there for a couple of years, so I was fine, but she did not like how narrow those roads were. It was, it was, yeah, awesome. Anyway, seize the moment while you're there. What a unique opportunity. You know, make sure the big stuff's still taken care of. Don't stop funding retirement. If you've got some debt that you don't like, get rid of it. But if you have some debt that's on a low rate and you're there for a few years, Maybe you pause. Maybe you like kind of go passive on the debt pay down and strike while the iron's hot, mm. so to speak. Yeah. While you're there. I don't know. But what's cool about it is I got totally sidetracked with samurai stuff. But <laughs> what's cool about it is yeah. you, you don't talk about the money for a while. You just talk about what you want to do. You divorce it from the money and you get the gears going. And then you impose reality money on it and start to actually prioritize. But it's fun just to let your mind go for a bit. You really find out what moves the person and, and then go from there. So yeah, I'd run them through that kind of an exercise. Hopefully there's one person listening. That's like, Oh my gosh, I'm here. What am I? Yeah, I'm going to do I'm this. I'm here. I need, I need to be a samurai, especially the woodworking one, man. Like those, those guys are next level, next level. So anyway, no, I love that answer for little airman, Jesse stationed in, <laughs> in Japan. Seriously. And you know, I, I get that question on Instagram and by email sometimes where these these guys, you know, they're 19, 20 years old. They're stationed in Japan and they're contributing 20% to their TSP. They've got a lot of money yeah. left over and they're like, where else should I invest? I'm like, invest in yourself. Go travel, yeah. man. Like buy a mm -hmm. $50 ticket to Korea and go see Korea for two weeks, you know, or mm. hop on a bullet train and get down to Tokyo. Like the world is literally your oyster yeah. when you're 20 years old, you're making too much money and well, maybe not too much, but, yeah. but you know, like put some money in your TSP, like you said, and then get out there and see the world. 
get some stories. Nobody's going to care. Yeah. yeah, make some stories. I maxed out my TSP when I was 20 years old. It's like, okay, good for you, kid. Nobody cares. Mm-hmm. Get out there and definitely contribute to your TSP and then, and then get some stories. Speaking of stories, you've got, I think, two podcasts. Is that right? Yeah, um, that one, you- of them's, one of them's the good one. And that's the budgeting podcast that I hate to say is budgeting. <laughs> It's just me ranting about trying to work the four rules. Yeah. And you can find that just, yeah, it's YNAB. But the other podcast that I started recently with a good buddy of mine is for business owners, where we kind of are taught, it's called Beginning Balance. We talk a lot about, well, we go on serious tangents over there, but we do try and apply this decision-making framework around spending in the small business arena because there's a lot more money flowing through business than there is in personal. So if you can right. redirect that flow, you even have an even bigger impact. So it's been a fun spot to kind of jump into pretty new. Same rules apply, but uh, just in the business sphere. Are there any episodes that you'd recommend listeners to go listen to off the top of your head on either of those shows? The first few of the beginning balance where we go through the rules for business owners they are, are solid. Some of the others, you can look at the topics and be like, oh, they talk about hiring, I don't care. They talk about process improvement, I don't care. But those first that are just applying the method to business thinking and strategic thinking. Those are fantastic. And then on the other podcast, I have no idea. It's probably almost 600 episodes at this point. They're all four or five minutes long. Like they're just a quick, it's a quick little hit. I think it's weird when people listen to all of them from the beginning, like it's super creepy. (laughs) I don't like that. Like it's, I've been doing this for 10 years. So they're like, oh, I love the episode. And I'm like, what did I say? Like, did I even say that? Like, it's kind of scary to think, you know, 10 years ago you were saying stuff. But they're all there and people just kind of get a little quick hit. And it's really just to kind of stay on track. Like, okay, yeah, I'm going to keep working the rules, but you don't need to listen to this voice for hours at a time. That, that'd be horrible. But Jesse, our time is coming quickly to an end. I want to give you one quick shout out on your podcast, the Wine App Podcast, because I'm continuously impressed that you can cover a complex situation like any personal finance or budgeting topic in four or seven minutes. Anyone that's been listening to me and Spencer for a while knows that we are more like 45 or 60 minutes and we tend to ramble and go on tangents like you mentioned with with your other podcast as well. So I'm very impressed by that and applaud your your short and concise episodes there. It's a gift. No, you're like, man, your answers here were longer than every one of your podcast episodes. That's quite something, you know, but yeah, there it is. We really appreciate your time today. Does YNAB offer a free trial period or how can users get started with if they want to learn more about YNAB, connect with you and your team, where should they go find you? Yeah, so YNAB.com, Y-N-A-B.com and you can find us there. The The software's got a 34-day trial and then see how it works from one month to the next. It's important that you kind of see that transition from month to month. But also we have online classes that people can take that are live if they want to learn more, we have a fun YouTube channel that people can subscribe to between, you know, subscribing to all the other rando stuff on YouTube. You've got that. So every once in a while on your feed, it'll pop up something useful about, you know, spending a little better. But honestly, if people just work the rules, like you don't have to use our software. I would love for people to. It's built to do the rules really, really well. But two things, if you're already hitting all your goals, just see this as entertainment. Number two is if you like the four rules and you want to implement them, you can use our software to do it. But again, the rules are free. It's just good thinking. So I don't want anyone to feel like they got to disrupt their whole flow just to use the software. But I am proud of it. And I'm proud of the team that puts it out there. It's, it's top notch. So yeah, that's kind, of, that's kind of a little bit of my pitch on that. But hopefully people pulled some extract out of this and can get some value from it. What about social media, Instagram page or Twitter or anything else where people can find you? Yeah, at YNAB for Twitter, I think. At You Need a Budget probably as well. I got off Twitter in, in 2016, so you can't find me, but people can email me personally if they want to, especially if you're you know, deployed in Japan and you are a young airman. Like, let's email me. Let's figure this out. But yeah, it's jesse at YNAB.com to shoot me an email. But I, I'm off social stuff just so I can stay focused on things that matter. No knock on anyone on social, <laughs> but I mean, let's be honest, you know, so. Yeah, well... I mentioned to you before we started recording and a little bit throughout the episode, I personally have been using the YNAB software and app since 2019, over three years now. And I'm really, really enjoying what you guys are doing. I really appreciate all the work your team does and how it's helped my wife and me communicate better about money and have that values-based spending that you talked about. And it's been really powerful for us personally. So thank you so much to you and the team. Thank you. That's awesome to hear. Well, Jesse, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Again, people can find you, youneedabudget.com or YNAB, YNAB.com. 
You also mentioned your socials there as well if they want to reach out. And again, I think this was an awesome episode. Hopefully there's some young airman in Japan that takes up Japanese woodworking and gets a samurai sword. And yes. thank you for the lessons you imparted today. Thank you for having me. Wow, what a great episode. Hopefully you all enjoyed it too. Huge thanks to Jesse and the YNAB team for coming on with us. That was a, a blast to hang out with him for a little bit. Our top three takeaways from today's episode are values-based spending. Spend more, spend less. It doesn't matter. Just ensure it's a good decision for you and your family. Number two, changing your budget is not failing. You have to adjust the plan sometimes. And number three, if you feel guilty when you're spending, you're doing it wrong. Money is meant to be spent, guilt-free, and aligned with your values. As always, thanks for joining us on the Military Money Manual podcast. If you have any questions or feedback for Spencer or me, hit us up on Instagram at Military Money Manual or email us too at podcast at militarymoneymanual.com. We continue to get great questions and discussion there, and we really love the conversations we get to have with our listeners. Don't forget to leave us a review and subscribe with that plus button or the bell so you'll see each new episode as we release them. Apple Podcast listeners, let's see if we can get our numbers up over there. Huge thanks again to YNAB and Jesse. Remember, you can find youneedabudget.com or the YNAB app in your app store for more information. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of the Military Money Manual Podcast. If you're enjoying the show, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. This helps others find the show, and we really appreciate it. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll catch you in the next episode. Hey, guys and gals. Spencer here again. Before I let you go, I want to let you know about two things. First, my 100% free course, it's called the Ultimate Military Credit Cards Course, and you can sign up today at militarymoneymanual.com slash UMC3. I've been running this course for over four years now, and we just celebrated our 7,000th graduate. In this course, I walk you through an absolute beginner's guide to travel hacking and opening your first fee-waived credit cards in the military. Again, you can sign up today at militarymoneymanual.com slash UMC3. It's 100% free, no spam, and you can unsubscribe at any time. Second, my book, The Military Money Manual, A Practical Guide to Financial Freedom, is available on my website and Amazon today. Head over to shop.militarymoneymanual.com, or if you want the Amazon version, search Military Money Manual. This is the book I wish someone had handed me on my first day in the military. In this book, I cover the exact money tactics and investment strategies I used on my path to achieve financial independence while I served in the U.S. Air Force. The book is the best personal finance book specifically for you, whether you're an active duty, guard, reserve, a military spouse, enlisted, or officer. Any ROTC or academy cadet can benefit from the tactical and strategic advice I lay out in the book. But don't just take my word for it. Here's two reviews of the book. Ryan on Goodreads.com wrote, the most comprehensive investing personal finance book specifically written for military members I've read so far. This book should be handed to every new LT at commissioning. Matt on Amazon said, this book is incredibly straightforward, easy to understand, practical, and useful. This book should be on the Commandant's reading list. Thanks, Matt. If you're interested in the book, head over to my website, shop.militarymoneymanual.com. And podcast listeners can use promo code PODCAST to get a special discount on the ebook, audiobook, and hardcover book. You can find the audiobook on Audible, the ebook on Amazon Kindle, and the hardcover book on Amazon. Or again, head over to my website and use promo code PODCAST for a special discount. Thanks for listening.